Hello and welcome to This Is Automation Live. I'm your host, Corey Dallas, and we're very happy to have you with us today to learn about ladder logic. So a lot of people ask me, why are you hating on ladder logic so much? Well, I don't really hate ladder logic, and we're actually gonna talk a little bit today about why it's actually a really great language to use in a PLC program. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but another language that I like is structured text, which is what we're gonna be talking about next week. So if you're not familiar with structured text or you wanna learn a little bit more about it, what some of the good use cases are for it, some of the basic concepts, make sure you tune in to that live stream, which is gonna be next week. The best way to make sure you don't forget that is to subscribe to the channel. And you can do that simply by hitting the subscribe button below and hitting the bell icon to make sure you get notifications. You can actually go into the This Is Automation YouTube channel and look through all of the live streams that we have scheduled and click on the ones that you want to watch. And from there, you'll get notified every time we go live on one of those. So I would highly recommend that so you don't miss any episodes in the future. But now let's move on to ladder logic. So we're going to give a quick introduction to some of the concepts behind ladder logic, where it comes from, and then we'll actually take a jump into some software and take a look at what it looks like live. And uh, hopefully my programming skills are as good as they used to be, and we'll actually be able to make some sense out of all of this. So to start, um, let's just look at what we have here on the screen, which is called a network or a rung. So when we talk about ladder, um, ladder diagram or ladder logic, it's made up of these networks or rungs. So the reason it's called ladder is because when you have a program that is made up of multiple networks or rungs, it looks like a ladder. That's why they're called rungs. So, you know, basically what we're trying to do with PLC programming, just to take a step back for a second, is ultimately take inputs, whether those are from our IO modules, from sensors, for example, um, or their internal variables, apply some logic to them, and then have outputs, whether those uh, outputs are simple, you know, digital outputs on IO modules, their internal variables, or something more complicated like motion for, for a servo axis. That's ultimately what we're doing. We're taking inputs, applying logic, and getting outputs. So that's the purpose of ladder diagram or ladder logic is to help enable us to do that. So where this comes from actually is back in, in the in the old days, um, there was actually relays that were controlling machines, not PLCs. And you had to actually use relay logic to you know, enable these logic statements that we're so comfortable now with in our PLC environments. So ladder was kind of used as a bridge from the older method of doing things to the newer method of using PLCs and taking advantage of some of the advanced functionality and computation that we have now in, in PLCs. So it's bridging the gap a little bit between two uh, kind of paradigms uh, for controlling equipment. <clears throat> so the great thing about that is that it makes it very logical. It's really easy to understand ladder once you've seen it, once uh, it gets explained to you. So hopefully by the end of this, you'll be feeling very comfortable with it. Um, the other thing that's really great about ladder is it's actually really easy to troubleshoot. And I think you'll, you'll start to see why when compared to text-based languages, having a graphical language like ladder diagram can be super, super helpful when you're trying to troubleshoot something. It's as easy as looking, finding the rung that has the output that you're trying to figure out why it's not turn, turned on. And then, you know, kind of backtracking through there uh, to understand what's going on. So really simple uh, to, to look back through and it serves as a nice, uh, you know, bridge between two different ways of doing things, looking at the old school relay and modern PLCs. So it's again, uh, a very uh, shallow learning curve, so to speak. So let's start diving into um, exactly what is inside of these rungs, and then we'll jump into the actual software to take a look at it. So when we're looking at a rung, on the left-hand side, we're gonna have our inputs in logic. So again, those inputs could be coming directly from an IO module, for example, or it could be an internal variable. And then on the right-hand side, we have outputs. So our outputs, again, could be tied to directly a uh, IO module, an output module, or it could be an internal variable that we're using for something else. But ultimately, again, we're just taking inputs, applying logic, and getting outputs. It's it's really, really quite simple in the way that Ladder is designed, makes it really easy to do this. So the easiest way to think about a rung is again, taking advantage of the relay logic that it's based on. So 
when you're building out relay logic, it's all about the flow of electricity. So here, if we think about electricity flowing across the rungs, it's gonna help you understand exactly what's happening um, to turn on or off a, a given output. So on the left hand and right hand side, we have rails. So, you know, you can think about the left hand side as your, your uh, you know, positive rail, and then the right hand side is your reference voltage or zero voltage rail. And so power is gonna flow from left to right. Now the contacts that we have, which is uh, what we're seeing here on the left hand side, this would be called a normally open contact. We'll talk more about the types in just a second, um, but that contact is either going to enable the flow to continue or it's going to stop it. Okay, so with a normally open contact, uh, it's normally open. So in the state that it's in right now, the flow of electricity is going to stop at that contact. So it's not reaching the output, which means that the output is false. Okay, so if we were to, ex for example, uh, to close that contact by turning that value true, then we would actually be able to enable the power to continue to flow through. So it's gonna flow all the way to that output coil. And what happens when we energize a coil well, it's going to turn that value true. Okay, so you can see how this is, you know, very much a parallel to how uh, electricity would work uh, with actual contacts in coils. Okay, so then it's going to flow through to the rail on the other side, which would be our reference voltage. So this is how the power flow or electricity flow works in ladder logic and how you should approach reading a ladder logic program. Okay, and if you have multiple rungs, it works exactly the same way. There can be some nuance in the order in which rungs are executed. Um, so we won't talk too much about that today, but just know that you do need to be a little bit careful about the order of things, uh, depending on how it's going to execute. Okay, but in general, if you have multiple rungs, it's still going to be flowing left to right, and the contacts will either enable or disable the flow, um, which will then either enable or disable that coil. Okay, so pretty simple concept, ultimately. Now, I've mentioned the word contact a couple times. There are actually many types of contacts that you can use when building out a ladder logic program. The basic types are shown here on the screen. We'll quickly walk through them here, but I think it makes the most sense to actually look at these directly in the software so you can see how they work uh, when we apply values to them. So the first one is a normally open contact. This is kind of the standard one, if you will. So basically, let's say we have input one is the tag or variable that we have tied to this contact. If input one is true, then that contact will close. And if input one is false, then that contact would be open, okay? So very much uh, like a switch. Again, so think about input one as whether that switch is opening or closing. With a normally open contact, it's normally open. So when we turn on input one, it's gonna close. And when we turn off input one, it's gonna open. Now, a normally closed contact is a little bit different. It has a similar symbol, but it's got a slash through the middle of it. With a normally closed contact, it's very much the same concept, but it's normally closed. So when we turn on input one, it's a little counterintuitive. It's actually going to open the contact. When we turn off input one, it's gonna close it, okay? So another way to think about this would be not. So, uh, it's kind of the opposite of a normally open contact. And so the kind of logical way to think about it would be uh, in a statement, not input one, okay? So we'll talk more about how that works when we're actually looking at a full rung. Positive edge and negative edge, these are very similar to the normally open, normally closed, but instead of being on or off all the time, the positive edge is only going to react when the input one changes from false to true for a single scan, it will remain on and then it will reset itself off, okay? Same thing with negative edge. That would only turn on when we're going from positive to negative, so from one to zero, and it would be true for one scan and then it would turn off. Okay, so let's look at the basic types of coils. Again, the most basic type of coil is just a coil. This is a standard coil. When it receives that power flow from the left-hand side, it's going to turn on. So in this case, we have output six tied to this coil. So if we receive power flow from the left, output six would come on. And if we lose power flow, output six goes off. Okay, the negated coil is very similar to uh, the normally closed contact um, that we were just looking at before. So again, it's kind of the opposite of the standard coil. Uh, if we're receiving power flow from the left, it's going to turn off, and if we're not receiving power flow from the left, it'll actually turn on output six. So the exact opposite 
of the standard coil. Now with set and reset, there's some interesting use cases here. There are a, a couple other types of coils that we won't talk about today, um, but with set and reset, what's happening is when we're receiving power flow from the left-hand side, we will set um, a value, but when we lose power flow, we're not resetting it. So that, that would be the behavior of a normal coil. When it sees power, it sets it, and when we lose power, it resets it. The set coil is really only the first half of that, okay? So again, when it sees power, it's going to set something high, but when it loses it, it's not going to change anything, okay? Uh, reset works the same way, but resetting a value. So it would take a value once it receives power flow from the left, it would take a value from one to zero, and then when it loses power flow, nothing happens, okay? All right, well, I think the best thing to do uh, at this point is actually jump into some software and take a look at what this stuff looks like. So I'll go ahead and do that now. All right, so what we're looking at here is BNR's Automation Studio. This is the IDE for any BNR PLC, okay? So what I've done here is dropped in a few rungs of ladder logic. Um, so you can see uh, the first one here, we're looking at pretty much our example from, from the very beginning. So we'll kind of walk through these examples one by one to explain the concepts. Now, we mentioned earlier about how to read logically a ladder rung. The easiest way to do it uh, is, is really using kind of the logical statements that we already know, if, then, or, and, so on and so forth. So with a really simple rung like this, we could read this as if normally open is true, then output one is true. And similarly, if normally open one is false, then output one is false, okay? So this is an if then, okay? So with a normally open contact, again, it's uh, gonna work very much like a switch. When we set it true, it'll close. And when we turn it false, it'll open. So right now it's false. So if we set it true, you'll see the power flow now can go through and it turns on output one. So now output one is set to true. And if we were to set it back to false, again, our power flow would then hit a brick wall here and not be able to continue through. So our output one is false. Well, let's look at the opposite case of normally closed. So right now, normally closed is set to false. But since this is a normally closed contact, it's actually letting the power flow through it. So by default, its switch is closed. Now, when we set it to one, it'll actually open up and then that would cause output two to turn off. So let's do that real quick and see what that looks like. So we'll set normally closed to one. And then you can see here that now this is true. And so I'm again hitting a brick wall and now output two is false, okay? So that's the basic concept of normally open, normally closed. And now we can start to combine these together to make logical statements. So again, let's look at this in the context of how we would read this out logically. We said already we start with if, right? So if, and now here we have two contacts, whereas before we had one. So here we would treat this as an and. So really the way to read this would be if input one and input two, then turn output three on, okay? So this is what we would call an and statement. And you're not just limited to two here, you can actually include multiple in series and you would kind of just expand your and statement. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So what happens if we turn input one to true, but input two is false in this case? Well, we're gonna let the power flow through input one, but then we're gonna hit that brick wall at input two because this contact is still open. So our output three is still false. And let's look at the case where, okay, maybe input one is true, but or sorry, input one is false, but input two is true. Again, we're hitting that brick wall up front. Um, so we're not even getting the power flow to input two. Now let's look at what happens when they're both true. Well, of course, because it's an and statement, they're going to pass the power flow through both of them and now output three is true, okay? So again, if input one and input two, then output three, okay? So when they're both true, output three is true. All right, now let's, move on to the next logical statement, which is what we call an or statement. So in this or statement, we're introducing something a little bit new, uh, which is this branch. Okay, so most of our rungs have been straight through. You can actually create branches, um, lots of different branches if you want. Um, and this would be kind of how we generate our or statement. So again, 
here, what you want to think about is you have two different paths to turn on output four. You can either do if input one, then output four, or if input two, then output four. Okay, so anytime we have parallel uh, branches like this, that's going to indicate an or, or multiple paths to turn on our coil. All right, so let's take a look at that. So we'll turn input one on, and very easily you can see here, our power flow is going through and turning on output four. We'll turn input one off, turn input two on, and again, you can see here, we're coming through from this lower branch and then coming up to turn on output four. Now, the interesting thing here is if they're both true, uh, you can see it doesn't really make a difference. So uh, we're getting power flow through input one and through input two. And of course, output four is still true there. Now, what happens if we want to be exclusive? So we call this exclusive or where we want if and only if one of them is true, right? So exactly one uh, to be true. Well, that's where we can use this XOR statement, this exclusive or, okay? So the way to do that in, in ladder is pretty simple actually. So we would use a normally open contact for input one, followed by a normally closed contact for input two. That would be our first path to output five. And then we would branch off in or and have a normally open for input two and a normally closed for input one. Now how this works is you can only ever have one of these true, right? Because if input one is true, then this one will inherently be false. And the same thing, if input two is true, then this one will inherently be false. So if they're both true at the same time, we won't get any power flow. All right, so let's look at the case where only one of them is true. So input one is true, but input two is false. So we have an easy path through here and vice versa. If we were to turn input one false and input two true. Again, you can see now we have a nice clear path to output five to turn it on. Now, what happens if they're both true? You can see that we hit a roadblock because our normally closed contacts are false for both of them. So they're open, okay? And so we hit our brick walls there and output five is false. So an exclusive or statement only works uh, when exactly one of the, the paths is valid. Okay, very good. Now, something that we haven't talked about yet is the use of function blocks. So function blocks are a really powerful part of ladder logic and of programming in general. These can wrap up more complicated uh, logic or functionality that you can then use inside of your ladder program. So one example of that would be a timer. So obviously we can't really create a timer with just our contacts and coils. So we need some additional function block to handle that. So in the BNR ecosystem, this is called the T on uh, or timer on function block. And you can see here that it's got a couple inputs on the left-hand side. So again, we're still working left to right is our power flow. A couple inputs on the left-hand side, one is in. So this is going to actually turn on the timer. So here we're actually using output five from above as our input. And then this other one is actually the time delay until this output turns on. So when output five is true, we're gonna wait three seconds and then our timer out will turn true. Okay, so let's take a look at how that works by getting output five to turn true first. So we'll have our exclusive or statement. So you can see here, we're starting to count up in our elapsed time. And after our time elapses, we will see this Q value turn to true. So there we go. So now our timer has worked and we are all good. Now, if we were to uh, turn output five false, then the timer is gonna reset. So we'll, we'll show that real quick as well. So there you go. Now output five is false. So our timer output is false as well. So that's an example of how you can use a function block inside of ladder logic. Now, what I wanna do is actually jump into a kind of example of how you might tie these all together in something like your first program. So the example that I want us to work through is I want to turn on an indicator light if my line is stopped for more than two seconds and it's in the run state, because I obviously don't want to be turning on indicator lights if my line is stopped and it's supposed to be stopped. But I also want to be able to turn on that light when I put the machine in manual mode and I turn on the manual light switch. Okay. So this is an example of a, a real life use case. Um, that you could do. And there's of course multiple solutions to this, but let's look at the one that's on the screen here. 
So we're, we're gonna break this down kind of step by step and then walk through the example. So again, the first thing that we wanna do is kind of break out you know, how this works logically. So there's gonna be two paths to turn on the light. One is if the line is stopped, run mode is on, and the other is if manual mode is on and the manual light switch is on. So we already know that we need two branches, right? And from there, we can just build out those two independent branches. So let's start at the top. So first we wanna sit, we want a timer, right? Because uh, we want to count the line stopped only if it's been stopped for two seconds or more. So here we'll use that T on block that we already used. And in this case, instead of having an output directly tied in, we're actually gonna use a contact to control the input. So only when line stop becomes true will we start our timer. Here we've got our target time, delay time set to two seconds, which is again in accordance with the specification. And then we only want this to actually go through to turn on the light if we're in run mode. And I've also added this normally close contact to make sure that we're not in manual mode. Okay, because we don't want any conflicts between the two possibilities. Now looking at our other possibility, our OR, um, what we want is manual mode to be on and the manual light switch to be on. Okay, and then we would want our indicator light to turn on. So we can see that indicated here. All right, so let's walk through these, these uh, possible use cases. So let's say our line stops. Okay, we have some sort of fault or something. We should probably be in run mode first course because our line is running and it stops so now we're going to see our timer count up until it hits two seconds and then it's actually going to turn on the indicator light so now you can see that our indicator light is on uh, because our line's been stopped for more than two seconds and we're in run mode and not in manual mode now let's say our line's back running um, we get we're still in run mode but we want to be in manual mode so i turn manual mode true okay so now you can see that our normally closed contact up here is going to prevent a line stop event from causing the indicator light to come on. Now I can actually control this indicator light with my manual light switch. So if I turn it to one, you'll see that my light turns on. And if I turn it to zero, you'll see that my light turns off. Okay, so this is just one example of, you know, how you can use ladder logic to uh, solve a logical problem. So we're again here taking inputs. Some of these would be internal, some of them would be external and driving an output, which in this case is an indicator light. There, you know, there is of course a lot that you can build out with ladder logic, um, building multiple rungs to actually make a machine or piece of equipment run. So there's a lot to it, a lot of function blocks that you're gonna be using, um, but here you have kind of the basic building blocks of what you would actually need to write a program. So you've got your contacts, you've got your coils, your function blocks, you understand how the power flows uh, in between, and you can easily create something like this, which you see here on the screen, a pretty simple system, okay? So that's the basic introduction to ladder logic. I hope that was helpful, I hope it makes sense. Again, know that our power flow is gonna go from left to right, our contacts are gonna be a combination of inputs and logics, and then our coils are gonna be our outputs, whether they're internal or directly tied to uh, IO cards. And from there, we can build out a really powerful program to control an entire machine uh, using just these rungs. So it's a really, really powerful uh, tool. And I think hopefully you can see how it can also be a really powerful diagnostics tool. Um, for example, in our ex uh, you know example we were just looking at, if our indicator light wasn't coming on, but we thought it should be, we could easily kind of walk back through those different contacts and see which one was not turning on. So it's a really easy way to kind of trace back and understand what's going on. So this is the basic programming language of industrial automation. And now that you know uh, the basics of it, you can start to build on that knowledge and continue to grow as an automation engineer or as someone interested in automation. Hopefully this was helpful. If you have questions or want a deeper dive into any of these topics, please leave a comment below. Uh, do read and respond to all of those. Um, so I'd be happy to engage with you on this or learn more about what you wanna know. Do make sure you subscribe to the channel, give it a like and share it with your friends. We do appreciate all of the likes, shares, subscriptions. They do mean a lot. Thank you again for joining us on this episode of This Is Automation Live, and we will see you next time. Thanks.